Everyone, good to see everybody here, and uh, and to um, a, a night to uh, honor uh, our friend uh, Dot, and uh, uh, we're going to hear all about her tonight. But I knew of her, and I and I want just to say one thing: is that besides her achievements, and you will see on that table over there, if you don't know her, many achievements throughout her her school school and um, uh, her time as a coach and things like that. But I'm, I just know of her as the, as a counselor and friend to uh, some all the people in, whose lives that she touched. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce her her nephew. Did I get that? And uh, Dan, um, Dan is a graduate of Hamilton High and uh, a, a graduate from Rowan with a master's. And, um, uh, and actually, so look, I can't believe how he's actually retired now. He became a, <laughs> a became a, uh, a principal, and uh, and then uh, at his young age he retired. So uh, with that, I make uh, a great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dan Benedetto. I don't know if I really need this, so no, I don't. No, no, no. We'll try it without. See how it goes first. Then I can always go. It's recording. So I just want to thank everybody uh, for coming out tonight and for inviting me to speak a little bit about Dorothy Cardica, the legend, or as we knew her best, Aunt Dot. Um, we've called our show tonight a legendary look back. I try to include things. Uh, in addition to her, her long career at school, you're going to find out some things that you didn't know before. So hang tight and we'll see. But before I start, I just wanted to say thank you to the Historical Society for the job that they do. Um, I didn't realize how extensive some of their collections are until I started stopping there and visiting and seeing what you do. And it's really a great job how you pull all these things together. I know. We uh, had donated some things last year, and in June, Deb did a whole display for Aunt Dot, and those are some of the things that appeared in the Gazette um, that we had donated, and they were all set up and really nicely displayed. And, and it really is it's good that these things that sit around in our basements, and ultimately our kids get them and toss them out, which that's going to happen. So, so I figured to send some things there and they can be enjoyed by the ages to come and it's really a great thing to have so thank you for the wonderful job that you do and it's always a good good thing it makes us feel good about donating these items so first of all again thank you all for coming there are some faces in the audience that are really really dear friends of hers so thank you for coming i know jack jacobs is here and Jack and Angie were staples at Aunt Dot's house, along with Sandra and Jack were there forever. So you can't hear me? If I talk like this, can you hear? Okay, all right. I never used a microphone in school because I had a big mouth and I used to just yell. And they would know, but anyway, we'll do that. Sorry about that. But anyway, so her goddaughter Jackie is also here and she's helped me a little bit with the presentation. I also want to thank Josh Trepichon who's here and helped me put this together. So Josh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So when we think about Aunt Dot, field hockey comes to mind right away. But there's so much more that I thought I can share with you other than just field hockey. She was a Girl Scout, a pianist, High school sports figure, NHS member, referee, co-owner of the townhouse, teacher, mentor, friend to so many, but there is absolutely so much more about her. To my brother and I, she was simply Aunt Dot. She was our fun aunt. She was the aunt that would take us to Maddie and Lou Colasurdo's pool on Central Avenue. And after the lunch shift got done on a hot summer day in the townhouse, we would head over to the pool and We'd stay there for a couple hours, then she'd get back in time for dinner. She used to take us to the beach, and our summer outing of the season was to go to Atlantic City and visit the ice capades with her sister-in-law, my Aunt Gladys, and Sandy, Debbie, and Gina. 
she did everything my mother didn't like to do. So we had two mothers, so it was really nice. Actually, three if you count my grandmother. So we had a good growing up. But tonight I want to share some things and go over some family history and highlight 90 well-lived years. Dottie was born in Hamilton on February 22nd, 1931. She was the second child of Tony and Nellie Fagletto Molinari and younger sister by six years to my mother, Rita, who was another icon in her own right. My grandparents were married. Ooh, we did a little too fast, sorry about that. There's a picture. I should have showed you a few seconds ago. Anyway, we found that. My grandparents were married on December 3rd, 1923 at St. Joseph's Church. And we were fortunate to find the wedding invitation somewhere in piles. Um, and they had their reception at Myers Hall, which was on a Carver Road. Now, I don't know if that was the VFW building or what it was. I posted it one time. Nobody seemed to know Myers Hall, but it may have been. So we think it was. But anyway, they got married at St. Joe's. The reception was at Myers Hall. My grandfather, Anthony, was a tailor that lived in Atlantic City. And he had a shop with his brother-in-law. My grandmother, Nellie, was the daughter of Angelina Di Giacomo and Ben Fagletto, a very prominent Hamiltonian at the time. And the remaining Fagletto is here tonight, so we're glad to have Nancy Joyce Fagletto here. Ruperton Mayorano, I'm sorry, I'll add those things. <laughs> <laughs> we, we refer to Joyce, to Nancy as Joyce. That's yeah. our cousin name of doing it, and Dave and Steve. We're all uh, related. And Dave did a great talk on old Ben last year in the Fogletto family, which I'm going to refer to a little bit. So, but anyway, they, uh, after they moved to Hamilton, no, I didn't, didn't say that right. I'm sorry. My mother, Rita, was born in Atlantic City uh, the year after they were married. And then uh, as Hamiltonians go, my grandmother didn't want to stay too, too far away. My wife says, you all have a rubber band around you and you snap back to Hamilton, which is what we did. That's what they did. She missed her friends, she missed her family, and had to come back. So they purchased a home at 116 North 3rd Street, and that's where Aunt Dot was born. A few years after they returned, my great-grandfather Ben needed someone to run one of his properties. I guess a little place on the corner of Railroad Boulevard and Orchard Street called the Central Cafe. So, as Dave said in last year's presentation, old Ben never stirred the pot. I don't think he ever served a table. So, Tony and Nellie came in to that hand, and they took over and worked at the Central for a few years. They rented out their house on 3rd Street and moved to one of the apartments up above the Central. So, Dot always enjoyed it, as she said, because she got to play with her Fagletto cousins who had the house on the corner of 2nd and Orchard and they would run down the street with her. So we have a few pictures there that were in one of Aunt Dot's scrapbooks. And I think Nancy's brother Ben is in this picture, and he was the same age as Aunt Dot, both in the class of 1948, and the other one was my mother. And these were Aunt Dot, I guess, when she was about one or two years old. She also loved the trips to her grandfather's blueberry farm out on Plymouth Road. And there we have her picking blueberries. I never knew that aspect of her. I never saw her pick a blueberry in her life, but we have it in photos, so we know she picked some blueberries. So after a few years at the Central, I guess things didn't work out. Nancy said family got in the way there, and uh, things didn't work out, actually. So my grandparents moved back to the house on North 3rd Street. Aunt Dot attended public school, and as many of you know, she loved to write poems and notes. There wasn't an occasion that went by where she wouldn't write something. And uh, we have a lot of personal notes that she did, but another one of her former students and, and one of her friends, Mary Beth Campanella, gave her a book and said, you should start putting these in order. So my aunt put everything in order, all these poems that she would write for school and the poems she would write for different things that would happen. And she attached a note on the book that said, when I die, give this to Mary Beth. So Mary Beth has that book. Um, but some of the notes that we have, 
we still have some of the things and we share those memories. She reflected on her kindergarten as having uh, received the olive oil pin. I personally think it's because of the bow in her hair that she wore all the time. And she said she got it by the, selected by the teachers. And Mark Anthony DeMarco received a Popeye pin. So that must have been a big thing back then. Going to, there's the bow. That's uh, one of their trips to Atlantic City to the Steel Pier. And that's Pete the Dog from the R Gang oh, fame. Oh, oh geez. So they got to visit with him for a while and take a picture. But anyway, Aunt Dot in fourth grade was crowned the May Queen. She said she was selected by her teachers that year, and they had a crowning right in front of the whole school, with the whole school attending. Her dress was made by her mother from my mother's old communion dress. And in the background, you see her sitting on the, I guess it's the Chiafalo Fountain now, and it looks like they set up a chair with an arbor in there, so I guess the water didn't run back then either, but um, it does now. And the Baptist Church is right there in the background. So that must have been a big event back then, but, but she was proud to be the May Queen. So she spoke at the time, too, that she would also help with her father's new venture, which was Tony's Bar. Tony's Bar was located directly across the street from what is now the townhouse, and the little place right there was the bar. That was the McCree House. It's torn down, and it's now the parking lot there across the street from the townhouse by Marinella's. But that's where he started the next bar. And my grandmother and Aunt Dot, I guess, used to help cook, and they would run the food over to this building because they lived only a few doors down. And he would serve sandwiches at lunchtime. So Aunt Dot also took piano lessons and participated in recitals with a teacher from out of town named Phyllis Bergenis. It was really interesting because I found some pictures of Aunt Dot and Phyllis. Um, this is Phyllis and Aunt Dot, of course, you recognize. She came to town to give weekly lessons, and what many of you probably don't know, she was also the longtime girlfriend of Aunt Dot's uncle, Bill Fogletta. <laughs> and I found also, in Aunt Dot's things, one of the old programs from one of the recitals. They used to really do it up. I mean, this lady had all these people play. Uh, some of the names that I recognize that are still around, we had uh, Joan Mortley, Joan Perna, and uh, Mary Joan Patali, Arena, uh, were also taking lessons and they participated in the, uh, the great recitals. So I thought it was really funny when I found these two pictures because after all these years, when, when she left town and didn't give lessons anymore, um, I guess everybody lost touch with her, Aunt Dot as well. But they reconnected somehow, maybe 40 or 50 years later, the poses, when I found these two pictures, were unbelievable because Phyllis has the exact same pose and so does my aunt, basically, you know, some 50 years later. So I thought that was interesting, so I thought I'd throw that in there. But anyway, Don and Phyllis continued their friendship up until the time that Phyllis died at a ripe old age, I think of 99 or something. So she was a girl that really loved sports. And back then, there weren't too many opportunities for sports, so she danced. She loved dancing. It actually said in her yearbook that she wanted to be a dancer. So here's Aunt Dot, I guess, doing one of her dances. The family also took many trips. That's a picture of my grandparents along with my mother and Aunt Dot at the World's Fair. But their, their usual trip was to Atlantic City almost every Sunday to see family members. Skipping ahead, Aunt Dot entered high school she was always busy, from what I understand. She was a commercial student. Now, that was new to me. I never, until I looked back, I didn't know what a commercial student was. But it was commercial. You were, you were one, too. Angela was one, too. Okay. Well, she was a commercial student. I think she wanted to dance and operate a business. That's closely related. She should have had a dance club. But anyway, she sang in the Glee Club, starred in a number of plays. We found some notes on this play. It was called A Case of Springtime. She had the lead, but she wrote down that she had a fever of 102 the night of the opening. So a good family friend and their local doctor, Fraser Elliott, came to the play and stayed backstage with her 
so that he could wrap her with a blanket every time she came off stage. So, and the play was directed by her mentor and good friend, it says Mrs. Romeo A. Falciani, who's Angela's Aunt Millie, and uh, my aunt and Millie were, were good friends for many, many years, and, and she always spoke highly of her and remembered Millie fondly. So, but that was one of the many plays I guess she started back then. That's Aunt Dot in the class of 1948. She was voted the most popular, best all around, and best athlete. Her class was a close-knit group, as Jack Jacobs can tell you, they stuck together for a long time. Aunt Dot and Jack's wife Angie were, were close right up until the end there. And uh, they were all in that class of 48. So, and in later years they had reunions and looking back at some of the scrapbooks, I can't imagine the reunions. As I was talking to Frank, who was in my class, our class gets together every 50 years. So, <laughs> this bunch gets together for any party. They used to party like crazy. So, she was a class secretary and treasurer, but gave it up because she wanted to do sports. She was involved and worked hard on the yearbook a member of the National Honor Society. She was a cheerleader, played tennis, basketball, hockey, and her love of sports was evident back then. The group of girls that she played with became good friends. One of the girls on her basketball team was Bonnie Jean Godfrey, who is now was the mother of the First Lady Jill Biden. After graduation, she continued her love of basketball and they formed a team called the Peachettes. The Peachettes, as it was known, was an independent team that played, as a, I quote from the book, circles against other girls in the area. There's a scrapbook that she made with all the Peachettes games that I had donated to the society and Deb brought it tonight and it's out there on the table. It's really interesting. Some of the names you might recognize, um, Anna DeMeo, Mortalite, in fact, she told me she was going to try to come tonight, so unfortunately she couldn't make it. Uh, Dottie Silipina Cassetta is still around. Kitty Welsh Benedetto, my paternal aunt, she's still around. And uh, you see some other people. Tootsie, Tootsie Burger. Burger's there, yeah. Grace, Grace Herrera Burger, and a few others. So, Dot had other ideas, though. She played, I don't know how she did all this stuff. I get tired just looking back at some of the things that she did, because she, she did. Uh, she promised, though, that she wanted to run this business, and she was relentless, convincing her father to follow his dream and build a restaurant in town. She promised to work with him. And so there's a picture of when they were starting to build the townhouse, back in probably 1949. My mother was teaching at that point. My mother didn't want any parts of the business and she let that be known. But Aunt Dot was definitely one that pushed him. She said, we can do it. And she played a role in design of the building that was on the corner of Third and Orchard Street, fittingly named the townhouse. And as you see, she took a very active role, she pushing wheelbarrows in there. I don't know how much she really did that, but it was a good photo op. But it was built by a, builder in town named Patsy Onofrio. He was the general contractor. And uh, there are some great pictures. That's them there. This is the massive basement, which is now the great whiskey bar. <laughs> you can see it from the top. Those are pictures from the grand open. Let's skip ahead to that, because that's the one-story building that many people didn't know. Back when it was built, it was only a one-story building. It was the bar in the front, the big horseshoe bar. It had the dining room in the back, and then behind that was a three-bedroom apartment, and that was located directly behind the kitchen. But anyway, the dream became a reality, and on April 26, 1950, the grand opening was held at the townhouse. And you could see there was the invitations that were sent out, the calling cards, the proprietor was Anthony Molinari. I guess back in those days, they didn't give the women any credit. He was the boss, I guess. So unfortunately, though, he became ill shortly after that and passed away in September of 1951 at the age of 54. So he left his family to pick up the pieces. 
You know, up until that time, he ran the bar. My grandmother did all the cooking, and my aunt waited on tables and did the bookkeeping. So once he passed away, though, my mom and dad had to come back into the business and help out. Mom still continued to teach, but she also helped with the business at night. So there's a picture of what it became. So very, very interesting. Somehow, though, that's a picture of Aunt Dot in the old kitchen. Kitchen's still in the exact same spot. Doesn't look like that anymore, right, Dave? <laughs> it's a little bit different. But that's the original kitchen, that little stove back then. And I thought that was neat. Then I don't know how she did this, too, but she also modeled. There were fashion shows, I guess, at the time, and here she is modeling. I found this newspaper article for the Vogue shop. So she kept herself busy. So at the end of construction of the townhouse, she met one of the carpenters that was there, a trade carpenter named Raymond Cardica. His family had moved from Winber, Pennsylvania. His dad was a coal miner and suffered from black lung and couldn't work anymore, and his mom worked at Kessler's factory. She got a job there. So the whole family moved and lived on Washington Street. Uncle Ray was employed as a um, carpenter with a builder named Chick Nikolai. He's an old-time builder from Hamilton, built quite a few homes. And it's funny because my grandfather, Benedetto, also worked for him. So, small world. But Aunt Dot and Uncle Ray were married on January 11th, 1953. And you may ask, where was the reception? At the townhouse. Where else could it be? Had to be there. So, Uncle Ray got involved with the business at that point. So, I was born the following year after they were married, and I kind of created a little problem. Not that I ever created problems, right, Sandra? Never. I created some problems. They were out of room. So what do you do when you're out of room? Aunt Dot and Uncle Ray got together and started to plan. And they planned the second story of the townhouse, which upstairs, if anybody hasn't been there, as Nancy will tell you, Dave and Steve and Beth, it's, there's two huge apartments up there. And when I mean huge, as, as a little kid, we used to run from one end to the other because uh, they both had two, we, all the doors were open back then. So we had six bedrooms, two bathrooms, two kitchens, two living rooms, and, and we loved it. So it was a great place to play and grow up. So it was no small task, but Aunt Don and Uncle Ray kind of designed that out, laid it out. And I guess my grandfather had the forethought to build the building and construct it with a way that they could add the second story on it. So with this steel structure, they went up to the second floor and there it is. Dottie and Ray were a real team together. They loved visiting the old Atlantic City and especially the 500 Club. They most often went there when her idol, Frank Sinatra, was there. And he used to go there quite often. Sinatra actually got to know them over the years and at one time gave her one of his cigarette lighters that had an emblem of his Palm Beach estate on it, which we still have. She cherished that lighter. Maybe that's why she smoked so much. I don't know. That's maybe where it all started, but we'll blame it on Frank for that. So, but those were the good old days of Atlantic City and things they really enjoyed doing. She also became a member of the Deborah Hospital Foundation and she planned the annual heart ball with constant fundraisers. I always remember in the townhouse, she had a table set up and they would sell something called poppycock, which was a popcorn type thing and fruit cakes. And that was a big thing for them. And then they would sell tickets for their raffles and all that. And there was always this table in the corner of the townhouse. And I'm sure she'd hit the customers as they came in and make them buy tickets. So she continued to be involved in the townhouse and also in sports. She made friends with a group of coaches who also refereed games in the area. And this gang always got together every summer at one of the other houses, mostly her house, I think. And they'd have a, a party and all get together. And they did that for years. I mean, I got to know them all pretty well. So, you know, how many years they were around. I guess you've all heard of the phrase, though, everyone meets at the townhouse. That's the truth. That was always the case. And I guess growing up in the townhouse, I have a lot of stories too, but there's too many for tonight. But one that relates to this story of Aunt Dot was we had uh, back in 1967, 
Father Harry Jordan was the principal of St. Joe's High School, and he was a regular. He was there every night for dinner. He'd stop in for lunch if he can get away. But he knew Anthos' connection with sports, and he was in need of a basketball coach. So he tried to persuade her for quite a while, and she finally conceded. So she began her career at St. Joe's High School in 1967, and she taught phys ed, and she loved every minute of it. Um, as this says in that yearbook, she was by then physical education, health, driver aid, training, driver education, girls basketball, and pep club moderator. I don't remember what the pep club was, but who knows, but, but she did it at that point. It was something that she kept on doing and she really liked after she did it. Um, she actually then enrolled in Glassboro, started taking courses toward a teaching degree, and then the, the jobs started to pile on there, as they do in a private school. Her role grew very big, and in 1971, it was time to move on. That's her 71 yearbook to some plays. She started getting involved in plays. That year, it happened to be Carnival. And I guess back from her days in high school of being in the plays, she really loved the plays. So here she did some things like The King and I, Music Man, Brigadoon, Bye Bye Birdie, Fiddler on the Roof, and many more. She actually did, I think, about 10, 10 to 12 plays. I'm not, not exactly sure of how many, because some of the yearbooks had plays in them, some didn't. So I was trying to track that down and find out. And it was easy for her because she could walk right there to work. So she had a key to the building. So after they got done working at the townhouse, they'd head down at night, and Uncle Ray would work on the props, and she would, she would be right at his side painting and doing those things. So it was really good and a, a good career. The, the plays were no shabby experiences, though. They even had uh, some things called uh, a dinner theater. As in one of the articles I found, Sandra managed a dinner theater. And they would sell tickets, have dinners, drinks, and everything for one night before the play started. So I guess they were ahead of their time back then. But it was a great thing, and she loved every minute of it. So did Uncle Ray. The carpenter came back, and this is him in 1977, working on the set of Bye Bye Birdie. Um, the class presented him, the group, the cast of the play presented him with a saw of uh, Bye Bye Birdie, which I also donated, and the museum had that on display, and also did an article about it in the Gazette, I think last year. So it's nice. So that's what I'm talking about. It's so nice to see these things displayed and enjoyed by more than just sitting in our basement. So we're happy to do those things. So, but being the strong and determined woman that my aunt was, she continued to work on convincing the principal at school to introduce field hockey. So in the 1972-73 school year, her dream became a reality. She raised the funds. She borrowed hockey sticks from Hamilton High School and her friend Barbara Butler, who coached there, and a few of her other coaches in the area. So the first hockey team at St. Joe's had borrowed hockey sticks. So that's what they did. But uh, these are some of the, the pictures we have from her hockey career. I'm not exactly sure of the dates, but all her Cape Atlantic uh, championship awards are over there on that table. And you can check them out. Really nice. Um, the townhouse was becoming difficult, though. Hockey was going great. The townhouse was becoming difficult. Um, you know, she didn't really want to do it anymore. Uncle Ray was getting tired of it. My mom had returned to full-time teaching, and my grandmother was in her 70s, so they decided to sell. So after some unsuccessful attempts, the business was purchased by Rocco Lewis Ruberton and his sons, who've made Rocco's townhouse the huge success that it is today. So we really feel good. And it's great to see the place that good and, and operating like it is. So done a great job. Thank you. So after selling the townhouse and moving on, and Don and Uncle Ray decided to move into the house that was on the back corner of the property that at one time they purchased from Dominic Patera. And the plan originally was to expand the parking lot and use this building for storage 
and uh, expand and make a bigger parking lot in the back. But that never happened. And the house sat there. It was a meeting hall. It's actually the oldest building, I believe, on that entire block. Um, we found when we opened up some of the walls, and I don't know what my uncle did with those, but there were um, Civil War memorabilia tucked into the walls. I remember a, a case with uh, no ammunition, but an ammunition case and uh, some neat things. Uh, but we never found those, so I don't know whatever happened to those. But, um, you know, they were tucked in the wall. So I don't know when it was actually built, but I would say probably before, you know, the turn of the century, sometime after the Civil War. And there were meetings in there. On the second floor, there was a big stage and uh, for plays or whatever. So it would be nice someday to find out some history on that building. So we'll start looking one of these days, try to find out what we can. We, Go get some walls. I think he got them. When, when he gutted the place, you know, Uncle Ray, he gutted it. So he did it. He built that, that building pretty solid. So we're happy to say Dave and Steve purchased a building in uh, their house, and it still remains as a house today. So we're happy. So where is this located? It's right in the center. It's be between Bellevue Avenue and Tilton Street, and uh, Tilton and 3rd Street, right behind the townhouse. Yeah but it's in the center of the block and everybody just built all around it. So very hard to find. I mean, the only thing going, I think it's a 16 foot brick driveway from Orchard Street that goes back to the house and then in the center. Dominic shop. Dominic Patera shop, yeah. <coughs> Dominic had, um, a, Dominic was a painter and he had, that was neat because he left a lot of paint supplies and old, uh, it's too bad. Uncle Ray chucked all them, but he was a sign maker, and there were all um, pieces and uh, neon signs he used to make, and all these designs for all these signs for all these places. It, it, as kids, they were all tacked up in there. Yeah, he left all those things in there, and he didn't want them when he, he did most of those signs. Like, I bet he did in this whole area. I bet he, did he probably did. Yeah. Metal. Oh, he did. He did the signs. He did the townhouse, sure. That marquee that was there, and then they took it away, and, and you guys brought it back, which was great. Um, but he did, uh, if there was a sign to be made, Dominic Batira made it. So, but that was his workshop back then, and they converted it into their house. And she lived there until she passed. But back at St. Joe's, the fun continued. So there were many things. The hockey team was in full gear. She produced and directed the plays. She became involved in other activities as well, such as the Forensics Club, the Atlantic County Junior Miss, Town Sport and Sports and Recreation Committee, which was then headed by Pete Rainier, the mayor. She also served as chairperson of the Superior Court of Atlantic County's Juvenile Conference Committee. So it's amazing. In 1984, she was honored with St. Joe's High School's first annual tribute night. It highlighted her remarkable career from 1967 to 1984. And back in that corner, we have some pictures of that night, her scrapbook. She also had a sign-in of all the guests that were there. So it was really neat to look through that and see, recognize so many of the names. But that was the first time that St. Joe started that, and I guess they had done that for quite a few years after that. But at the end of the uh, program for the evening, it said the best is yet to come. And it sure did. Dottie was selected to coach three North-South All-Star field hockey games. In 1993, she was inducted to the New Jersey Coaches Hall of Fame. And that picture was taken up at her dinner. Sandra's in the picture. Angie Jacobs, her good friend, Jack's wife, and Nancy's mom were there. And were there, and her assistant coach at the time John DeMarco, Father Burns, my brother, my mom, dad. So we'd gone up and uh, it was a great honor for her to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. She was also named Coach of the Year for the Courier Post. She was also three-time coach for the Atlantic City Press. So most notably though, she led the St. Joseph girls field hockey team to Cape Atlantic Championships for each consecutive year from 1982 to 1990. Cape Atlantic Division title of National Division winners 1994 and 1995. 
She continued to go strong until her retirement in 1996. What a career. In hockey, she amassed 254 wins, 52 losses, and 65 ties, and 16 Cape Atlantic championships. 23 years. That's a pretty remarkable record. And she loved her job, and she loved working with all her kids, her girls as she called them. It was great. She was always an advocate for women's rights and equality, especially in sports. She fought hard to make sure that the girls, who often referred to her as Ma, or Coach, or Mrs. C, received the recognition that they so deserved. It was nice to see that uh, after they started for a few years, field hockey ended up on the second page right behind football in the yearbooks. I thought that was an interesting task. So, as a teacher and a coach, she respected the students, and in turn, she expected them to respect, expect, she expected it right back to her. She was very tough from what I understand in school, but she was fair. Maybe Nancy or Jackie can tell us about that and see, but, but that was Aunt Dot. So we believe that she was a true forerunner in building strong women in grace, dignity, and education to help them find their place in the world and to be heard. Programs that she started at St. Joseph's High School, along with her involvement in school, community, statewide programs are a testament to that. She coached and taught so many wonderful students over the year. So many became her friends up until the time she passed, and she enjoyed hearing from them. They became coaches, doctors, authors, lawyers, nurses, teachers, mothers, deputy mayors and mayors. We have Teresa Kelly here tonight, one of her former students, and political figures, which even included the senior advisor to the former president of the United States. She was proud of all her kids, and they were her girls. But retirement from teaching did not mean that she was finished. She had a little bit of time to go. One of her former principals, Father Joseph Burns, asked her to be a part-time secretary at St. Anthony's Church. Well, as I said before, once you get in, once you get pulled in, she became full-time very quickly after that. And she served as Eucharistic minister and elector. She was a woman of very deep faith and received the St. Anthony Parishioner of the Year Award in 2008. In 2010, she was awarded the St. Joe Wildcats Fidelis Award, and that was something she was very proud of. Um, they invited her back, had a, a nice dinner for that, and um, that plaque hangs in St. Joe's Academy. They asked for that, and uh, hopefully it's hanging in a prominent spot on one of their walls today. But she was very proud of that award. She also uh, received the Sir Optimus Woman of Distinction Award. She remained very active in Junior Miss and was now involved on the state level. She continued to volunteer at Kessler Hospital until it closed, was active in the Hampton High School National Honor Society Foundation. And then she found a new love. She traveled a little bit, finally. She went to Hawaii, Greece, Malta, and Italy. And she loved those trips. So at an early age though, Aunt Dot loved her animals. And anybody that knew her loved how much she loved them. Here's a picture of her as a child. She's holding her cat at that point. And then when we were at the townhouse, we had a cat named Choo Choo. And that was her favorite. This was the uh, mascot dog of the townhouse, Archie. Everybody knew Archie. And then there was Luke with my niece, Nicole, and Angel with my daughter, Danielle. But the most popular one, her final dog of all times, was Gigi. And Gigi's in that picture with my niece, Nicole, and my daughter, Danielle. Funny story what Aunt Dot did to me with Gigi. I got a phone call. I was working at school one day, and I got this phone call. And it was my daughter, and she said, we're going up to get a dog. I said, who's getting a dog? She said, Aunt Dot's buying me a dog. I said, you're in college. You don't need a dog. Who's going to take care of this dog? So Aunt Dot, as we know Aunt Dot Wood says, I got it under control. Don't worry about a thing. She said, the dog could stay with me during the week, and then when she comes home, the dog will come to your house and stay so she could have the dog on the weekend. So the dog could stay with me. So my secretary had to actually get up and come and close the door because I think I was yelling so loud. <laughs> uh, not to dare bring this dog into the house. 
I uh, called my wife Maria and said, call your aunt and tell her we're not getting this dog. But there was no convincing her. The dog came and uh, I have to admit, I do love that dog. So at 13 years, Gigi is still going strong and we hope she's around for many, many more. So, but the, that was the funny story about Gigi and my aunt. My aunt could be seen all over town though with Gigi during the week. We would hear about places she would go. Uh, it was the forerunner of service dogs, I guess. She would take the dog into any store, and I don't think anybody ever threw her out. The dog always tucked under her arm. The dog would sit on her lap driving all over town. Uh, I don't know, but she did it and got away with it. So, you know, but that's Gigi. But once a coach, always a coach. And what made her really happy was when her former players, children, became involved, especially in field hockey. Here's a picture of Jackie Kincaid along with her daughter. Cassie and Doobie Morano, who was also one of her assistant coaches for a time with her daughter up at Eastern, right? But that was for a tournament up there. And Aunt Dot would try to follow all the kids' tournaments, even into her late 80s. I think she she never missed some games. She would park at my mom's house and run over to the Hamilton High School field to watch what was going on across the street. So, but then as we know, COVID hit. And uh, it was a rough time for her. Things really changed. Uh, her annual Tuesdays spent here at the Canoe Club came to an end. Her weekly casino visits stopped. <clears throat> she couldn't dine out anymore. And she celebrated her 90th birthday at our house. Very quiet affair. It was only the three of us and, and Aunt Dot. But, but she was happy. And, uh, you know, it, it, she missed all the things that she could have done. COVID took a lot away from all of us, as we know. But it also put her hobby of crocheting into high gear. She started making, or continued to make afghans, but she went full speed. She made them for all the nuns, she made them for all her family, made them for friends, former students. If somebody was having a baby, those needles came out and she was whipping together these creative gifts that she loved to do. Oh yeah, <laughs> they are, they really are. But she was always prepared and she always knew how to, to make things happen. These are notes that we found after she died. I said she kept the notes and this was to my daughter. She left a box for my daughter and a box for my niece. And she said, just in case I'm not around for the blessed day, love you, Aunt Dot. Aww. And this was the, Af uh, the Afghan she made for my daughter. Now we say she, she kind of set the things in motion because what was really funny is the two Afghans were wrapped with these little bows and she left them as samples so we could tie the bow, whatever the sex was, tie the bow on. But Danielle's was a blue bow and she just had a boy a couple weeks, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And my niece had the pink bow and she had twin girls. Oh, so yeah. and, and Dot set the play into motion with that, we think. So, but she always, uh, you know, did something neat like that, and it was it was a great tribute. But her little notes were, were hysterical. We found them all over. But to paraphrase the Frank Sinatra song, she did it her way, and there's no stopping it. She drove almost until the end, although I'm not sure how well, but <laughs> she did. We tried uh, not to, but she was insistent. Uh, she enjoyed her dinner with her cousin Nancy at the townhouse, of course. And then there were the Friday Boggle games, the Yahtzee games, and the occasional trip back to Atlantic City. She passed after a brief illness in 2021, the week of my daughter's wedding, which was pretty sad for all of us. Um, but she had that planned as well. I mean, she had everything set up. She, I remember, told her nurse, hurry up, I have to go quick. I don't want to ruin the wedding. And. Uh, it, it was really funny because the nurse told us this after. But this is our last picture we have of Aunt Dot. And it's funny because she tried on the gown for the wedding. And Maria snapped a picture that day. She tried it on to show Danielle what it looked like. And uh, this was maybe about two months before she passed. And she was ready to go. She didn't want to miss that wedding, but unfortunately it did. But she left us, when she died, handwritten detailed, and I mean detailed, directions for her funeral. 
and for distribution of everything in that house. <laughs> there was a note on the safe, right? This goes to Dave. There was a note, uh, notes all over the place. So we tried to do our best to take care of all those wishes, but the tributes poured in. And by the amount of people that attended her funeral, she was far from forgotten. And it, I think it was really a tribute to her because let's face it, there's a lot of times, I mean, you know, she had no children of her own. We're, we're there, but you know, it was just an amazing tribute to see that many people still remember her after all that time. And it's a tribute to see the people that still remember her tonight. So her last tribute was in 2022 when St. Joe's Academy named their annual fall run in her memory. She would have loved that honor. Um, it was a big deal for them and, and, and they really played it up nice and she would have enjoyed that and she would have certainly enjoyed the tribute tonight. Um, she loved the limelight, as you know, you see by those pictures. So this remarkable lady will undoubtedly be classed as one of Hamilton's legends and will hopefully be remembered for many, many years to come. So I, I want to thank everybody. I know like I said, some former students, Jackie, Nancy are here tonight, and Teresa. Um, you know, she was very proud of them and all her students. She she did, she was an amazing woman. And uh, going through these boxes, looking at these, these items and things like that, she surprised me. There were things in there I found I didn't know. But the secrets continue, and Aunt Dot amazes us all, and, and she's a remarkable woman. So... Thank you all for coming tonight. If you get a chance, go see some of those artifacts we, we dug out and uh, keep giving to the Historical Society. They need everybody's help. They do a great job. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming. that was a big thing too back then right yeah okay. it was bad <laughs> no the pic central i couldn't find any pictures of the central at all i don't yeah. they, do you guys have any of them or yeah, it was built i guess ben pogletto built the building and then with his cousin <clears throat> di giacomo right i guess right. uh I don't know, then the Giacomo's ended up having it or something. Yeah. It hasn't really changed. Hmm? It hasn't really changed. It has it oh, did now. Because now there's these huge windows. I noticed tonight when I drove by and changed the windows. Are. Yeah. Yes. Uh -oh. <laughs> Those are fighting words, right? What? Those are fighting words for you. <laughs> the funniest thing is I, I don't think I ever went in there. It's, it's better than what he was going to do. Oh, okay. Right. What is it? I told him not to paint the brick. I mean I told I didn't tell him not to paint the brick. I said it's frowned on in historic <laughs> and he didn't, and then, and or stuck away, because yeah. that could have happened. Yeah. Well, great grandpa built those other buildings where the barber shop is and all that around the corner as well. And I think there was another one in there that they tore down. Unfortunately, the Pogletto house is gone. Uh, Johnsons purchased it, and then tore the house down and moved, and moved, their, moved their house down. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And me being, I guess, I always like history. We left a, a time capsule in the basement. There was an old refrigerator left in the basement. And uh, we went down and we, we took wine bottles, those big Chianti bottles from the townhouse, and plugged them. And we left notes in these things, put them in the refrigerator down there. And I asked them one time if they ever found anything when they, they dug the foundation. But they, apparently they didn't. But, so our time capsules might still be down in the basement. Down so it was neat. But, any other comment? There's a uh, a proclamation when Teresa was deputy mayor in Buena Vista Township. She came to all Aunt Dot's functions. I think that was on her retirement. Uh, she had a proclamation named for it. There were proclamations from county, state. Um, I gave one to uh, town hall. I don't know what they did with it, uh, but one that came from Hamilton. So well, Teresa, trying to share the wealth and enjoy these. Teresa and Nancy right. were both on her first hockey team. I still have both. I still have one of those wooden hockey sticks she got. Do you really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> oh no. There was one. Uh, Jackie has that. I think the one that said Mrs. Cardigan on it. Yeah. It was a hockey stick that said. Uh, yeah. Somebody had it made and they carved out 
her name in the hockey stick. So she treasured that and had it for a long time. And I know uh, Brenda DeMarco, one of her other, or Brenda Pinto, one of her other players, uh, incorporated it into one of the floral arrangements at her funeral. So. Then I think the, the first win of Cape Atlantic was our senior year, 1975. Wow. Oh, okay. And that was the first year that, that was, was the first 31, year. I believe. Yeah. yeah, so I hope I got the facts straight because back then I was in college, so it was <laughs> oblivious. I didn't follow too many things other than... I guess parties at college. I don't know. <laughs> Thank so, you, dear. It was interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.